In this episode of the Ultrasound Leadership Academy Image Review, I'm going to share with you a lecture that I gave at our local residency where I went through a few cases. Now, there was a pretty big focus on muscular skeletal complaints because I happen to think that it's great to use the ultrasound for that specifically. Patients love it, and it's pretty accurate when you know what you're looking at. I hope you enjoy it. Now, on to the podcast. All right, everybody, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the people that I don't know. Um, um, hello, front row. How are you? Congratulations. Um, 10 points for being front row. Um, you got seven. Um, we're going to talk about ultrasound. Oh, if you don't know, I'm uh, one of the attendings. Um, I know I look so young, but I'm one of the attendings. And uh, I do ultrasound stuff with uh, Dr. Macias. So I actually, Macias was scheduled for this, but I decided to, um, or he asked me, and I was like very happy to take this because I, I like going through these cases. Now, probably I want to say 85% of these cases are ones that we had here within the last year. Um, so just to show you what we can do. We're, there's a lot of things that we can go through, and I basically have it set up depending on how, like this, you know, I have like 80 slides on here. If we get through 10, there's no problem. It's just us kind of talking through slides, which I think has a bit of educational value. All right, this patient, uh, they came in with rib pain. They got an MBC and had negative x-rays, negative rib series, but it was their second visit because they continue to have pain. You put an ultrasound transducer on the place where it hurts, the exact spot that it hurts, because it's like one spot that it hurts. Um, does anybody know what we're seeing here? It's a fracture. It's a rib fracture. Um, ultrasound's actually uh, quite sensitive and specific. Um, for rib fractures as well. Um, the CT scan would be the gold standard for sure, but what we wanna see is we wanna see this. You see how this is nice and kind of linear? There's no edema around it anywhere. It's like a nice straight line. This is what a knot fracture looks like. And then when we look here, we are seeing just a very clear angulation. I'll pause it, a very clear angulation. It's even kind of like offset, like it's like broken and then it went like this. And then the kind of extra thing, because especially if you're looking at, let's say, the sternum, because that's actually been well described in the literature. If you look at the sternum and you find the um, xiphoid process, that joint can kind of look like a fracture as well, just because it's a disruption. Although typically the distal end would be angulated um, posteriorly. What's kind of tipping us off is first off this, this kind of offset right here, and then this bit of edema around it, which is like the fracture already trying to heal, or maybe a little bit of blood um, kind of around that fracture. Um, another thing that will clue you in, big thing, um, is the patient came with pain, right, in that spot. The patient's history was trauma, so this will help clue you in as well. And then if you look up here, um, I imagine this could just be subcutaneous tissue, but this is also what edema looks like, which if you have somebody that has blunt force trauma to their chest, they'll actually have some soft tissue swelling around that area as well. Um, so another thing that kind of clues you in. Um, and then if you didn't know, this was the chest. You see this thing right here? I don't know what it is, but it's, it seems like the heart. It seems like it's beady. It's kind of coming in and out of view, so it's probably the heart. Probably left-sided. Okay, um, next patient comes in, and they have chronic, uh, not chronic, let's say it's been about a week, maybe two weeks, of increasing pain, swelling, and redness to their elbow. They have a, it hurts when they range it, but they are able to range it. And this is your ultrasound. What do you guys think? Like ortho consult, we need to get an IND. X-ray is negative. Um, okay, Dr. Uh, Wayment, um, why is it not an abscess? Why is it not inside the joint, like an effusion? Uh, well, so we're looking from the, I guess, the skin down. We mm -hmm. see cobblestone in there. This right here. Superficial. And okay. For the probe, uh, no obvious fluid pocket there mm -hmm. above the muscle. So this is key right here, this is huge, is that you use this as a landmark, and that's brilliant. Um, muscle is perfectly accurate because this is a, like the end part of the muscle. Uh, but this is one of the, you know, the tricep tendon is actually like, or the triceps, three muscles that go into a single tendon and attach here. Um, it might have two heads actually. But in any case, technically it's a tendon. For joints, anything above the tendon is outside the joint. Anything below a tendon is inside the joint. So strong work, 100% correct. Okay, same exact patient. And then we see this. What is that? Is 
It's definitely a fluid collection. You're like eight, 90% right, like 90% right. But the management is different between this and an abscess. Same patient as before. It's bursitis, right? And the reason it's not an abscess is you see how there's, the fluid itself is relatively hypoechoic and you're seeing these little kind of septations within it. Abscesses don't typically form like that. Um, this is typically a chronic fluid collection that honestly is usually aseptic, right? Because um, most bursitis isn't septic, it's just bursitis, which is in inflammation. Um, how, so abs let's say that we considered it an abscess. Um, would, would we get in trouble if we opened this? Because that's really the question, right? Like we have the ultrasound, but what do we do with this extra information now? We, we need to know what, like, you know, you pick your nose, and then like, what do you do with the booger afterwards, right? So we have this like extra thing, but what do we do? Eat it. Yeah, that's the right answer. We definitely eat it. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, an abscess, like you'd want to lance it, you want to uh, let the fluid out, right? Probably, it might make the patient feel better, you know? What do you think? I think I probably would. Probably would. Because there's a lot of skin infection. Okay, right? Because what if, what if it's aseptic, right? Because the bursa technically is like a little outpatching from the joint itself, right? So let's say it's not septic, you have overlighting cellulitis. That's a very good point. Um, uh, septic bursitis, there's, you can all look it up online. I have to like honestly look it up all the time. Um, but, because the guidelines change. But as far as I know, the most recent guidelines recommend not doing anything about these. Um, antibiotics work, NSAIDs and compression. And then if it doesn't work, then antibiotics and then opening. Um, for, and please correct me back row, um, but it's just something that we see. And it's something that I always have to look I'm up and I feel like guidelines always change. Yeah. Back row, what do you guys, uh, what's your, um, I guess, thoughts on septic, let's say it's the first visit, septic bursitis. You think it's septic bursitis. Get this image. Would you open it? Would you give antibiotics? So you can do, yeah, and I think that's a good idea too. So you wouldn't lance it, you just kind of like 18 gauge aspirate? Because it's, it's fluid, right? It's not pus. Okay. No, I drain it and then pour it so yes, and uh, I looked at the AFP guidelines more than that, and they actually say that you, they actually recommend um, compression if you're f fully, and NSAIDs, if you're fully aware that it is like infected, um, then antibiotics and then drain it second line is what they recommend. Um, but remember guidelines are just guidelines and this is AFP. I don't think, I've, I couldn't find an ASAP recommendation for this. Um, I didn't look further than AF AFP and ASAP because this is, uh, um, I don't think there's a lot of people that have to deal with this besides us. But guidelines, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, it's a lot of yeah. So the prepatellar bursitis are pretty common and they can get pretty sick. They can get septic from these and they can look like a septic joint. Mm -hmm. um, and so my suggestion is if, if it's big enough, you drain it, uh, you consider a septic joint also, and then you know, I would say that even though it's outside the joint, I would be good for what they would call before and after. Yeah, and with this, or you got to remember too, is that like guidelines are important um, because they kind of give us like this kind of background to, to build off of this foundation. Um, but you don't have to do exactly what guidelines say because guidelines um, take a long time to actually like be created and they might actually be behind what the most recent literature shows. So let's say guidelines say definitely don't drain it. And then let's say tomorrow a randomized control trial of like, you know, 3,000 patients comes out and it turns out draining it is the right thing to do. I would probably switch to draining because that's how science works, right? As we get more information, we adjust. Um, yeah. Now, same exact patient. This is like a multiple timeline situation, right? Um, same exact patient and you have this. That's definitely an effusion in the joint. This is the tricep right here. We're a little on the humerus itself. And this is one thing that actually confused me quite a bit. Um, this whole thing is the humerus. This is like one of, I don't know, the epicondyle, like condyle and epicondyle or something. But this whole thing is actually the elbow. The olecranon is all the way, or sorry, the uh, humerus. 
the elbow itself is all the way over here. You just got to remember that the joint itself, actually it starts all the way up here and then goes all the way kind of like down here. So it's not just like just the space in between the bones. It actually is uh, like almost like a bag that surrounds the interface between two bones, right? Um, now what about draining? How many people here have drained an elbow? All right. We have... Why did you have to think about it? Because it happened first year. Oh, okay. It was, it, was, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Honestly, like, as far as, like, ER time, like, between first year and third year, that's, like, a long time. It's, like, five years, right? It's, like, five years in, like, regular years. Um, what was, do you remember what your approach was? Like, I know, five years ago, but... We did, actually, when we were, we did, like, a Rosh review earlier, mm -hmm. and we did do ultrasound, like, but we also used landmarks, like, the lecronon and mm -hmm. the radial head and kind of just went laterally right under there. Yeah, I used the triangle. Yeah. But then we did it under, I did it dynamically with ultrasound. Brilliant. Um, it Andrew? Big, so. It was what? It was big. Yeah. So I actually, it's hard those, I mean, those big effusions, I think they're like, especially if you're not experienced, like you should do those with ultrasound more because they're the easy ones to do under ultrasound guidance, right? So like you do it that way, um, you can practice on like an easy one for when you get the hard one. Um, what about you? Lateral approach, yeah. That's typically, honestly, like where the pocket seems to be the easiest to get to. Um, you can definitely go uh, medial anterior and lateral anterior, but there's more structures there, there's more tendons. I would honestly go where the fluid is like the easiest to get to. Just kind of like a pericardial effusion, right? If you need to drain a pericardial effusion, um, I would almost like, unless it's the only window that I can find, I would not go sub xiphoid, right? I would actually go parasternal um, or apical because that's closer to there and you don't have to go through liver and diaphragm to get up there. Um, what about um, back row? Have you guys done anything other than the lateral? Because I've only ever done like the probe here transverse with the needle going straight down this way. Anybody? I mean, is there another approach for us really? I just feel like that's the easiest one because the patient like is comfortable like this, you know, and it's just, I don't know, it's just easy. All right, sweet. Thanks for validating me, Dr. Hayden. And then just for a recap, these are the three. Do we have any questions? How do we feel? Okay. All right, sweet. I just, I really feel like MSK is like important for us um, because it's so easy to be like, I don't know, let's get an MRI, CT, let's send you out. But it's also actually pretty easy to diagnose this stuff on ultrasound, I'd say. I'm gonna take a little pause here and remind you about the Ultrasound Leadership Academy. It's a very comprehensive ultrasound fellowship. Think about it like an online ultrasound fellowship. We do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. We do image review for you. We give you a year-long didactics that is, I think, great. I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think it's good. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about it, you can reach out to me at javila at ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com. You can reach out on the Instagram or wherever you consume this video. Now back to the podcast. What is this? Let's say same patient, um, but now they have redness on the forearm. What do you think? Okay. Sweet. So no abscess, right? Do we see any cobblestoning? It's a little bad. I mean, it's not classic cobblestoning, but you can see like fluid between these little like islands, right? Of um, subcutaneous tissue right here, right? But it's not like classic cobblestoning. I think that's important. Um, you often, quite frequently, especially in advanced cases or when there's a lot of fluid, like edema, you will see the classic cobblestoning that you, you know, we always talk about. But sometimes it's just going to look like this. It's quite distorted architecture is what it's going to look like. Now, the reason that I wanted to show this one is actually, it's interesting, is I love that people picked out on a concern for an NSTI or a, um, shit, what is an NSTI? Necrotizing soft tissue, thank you. <laughs> thank you, future ultrasound fellow, brilliant. Um, uh, but I don't, it wasn't, and here's why. So we're seeing here, and you see how these are a bit brighter, right? And we always think about things that are bright on ultrasound, what could they be? Um, can I pick on you? Yeah. Do you mind? You can say no, I won't get my feelings hurt. Yeah. What makes something white or dark, on, white or black on ultrasound. Why would it be white and not black? So it's like the ultrasound beam like bouncing off um, versus going straight through it. So it's going straight through it, it's uh, darker. Because mm -hmm. no reflections are coming right. back, right? Brilliant. 
And then the brighter it is, the more reflections are coming back. And you also get reflections at any differences between, bear with me, the acoustic impedance gradient. Any difference in tissues create a reflective surface, right? So anytime that you have a difference in the density of material, it's gonna actually reflect back in the absence of it being like calcium or a bone or anything like that, right? Now the key here is when we look at this, like let's just take this one right here, it's a pretty bright line. And if this was air due to this bright line, we'd have essentially no visualization deep to it. And we're definitely seeing a little bit of mild shadowing over here, but I'm seeing actually like pretty decent amount of structures. It's just the reflection's coming back a little bit distorted, right? And this is because the differences in the acoustic impedance gradient. We're not seeing kind of drop out, complete drop out. Now up here, we're seeing quite a bit. And this, if I just saw this, I would be a little bit concerned like, oh, is this gas? And I have to think about it, right? But if we look, let's say that, you know, we can imagine the origin of the shadowing is right here. Do you guys see anything hyperechoic up there? I don't really see anything hyperechoic. And I've actually wondered about this. And I think what's happening is I think that we have little curves, like the islands of the soft tissue. And what happens is remember, uh, has anybody heard of an edge artifact? So I think that these are, because it's never really been like talked about in the literature, I think that these are types of edge artifacts when you have such distortion of architecture in the soft tissue. The other big thing, of course, is we're not look. I mean, I'm grabbing these on image review because I don't know if you guys know this, but I look through scans. I mean, it's based off my availability, but I probably look through about 20 to 30% of y'all's ultrasound images. Um, and I'll, I don't know if you've, I've sent a couple of you notes like directly from Butterfly when I have like feedback to give you. Um, and so I don't really know the clinical case for this, but one thing, of course, is like anything else is to clinically correlate. Now, uh, yes, Taylor. Could, could that be, I mean, kind of along what you were saying with like edge artifact, like mm -hmm. classically we talk about cobblestoning with cellulitis, but mm -hmm. there's also like the kind of a loss of architecture, like the kind of fogginess, mm -hmm. or shadowiness, mm -hmm. like maybe like that's on a spectrum with sort of this thing is more, maybe more pronounced. Agreed. And that's the thing is that there is, as far as I know, there's no like data to actually like say what I'm saying, but this is based off of me having done this for a, you know, a few years. Um, yeah. And this is kind of similar to that, right? This is a little less of that shadowing, but you can see that there is like these strips of area where it's like a little darker, right? As you go down. Um, and this is also cellulitis, even though we don't see like that classic cobblestoning. Now, this one's gonna be interesting because I wanted to do a little bit more advanced for you guys because you know we, Mike and I talk about ultrasound a lot. What if this patient comes in? What do we think? Now I want us to pay attention to the shadowing. Is it dirty shadow or is it clean shadow? Meaning is it completely black deep to it or is it kind of a gray but we can't really see exactly what the gray is. The gray is dirty shadowing air and if we have a complete actual dropout of shadow, is an air actually? What do you guys think? So part of, I mean, part of this is I'm, you know, blowing up a three megabyte image into like a HD screen, but this is pretty pronounced shadowing right here. Pretty pronounced shadowing, like completely black deep to it, right? If you have somebody, and we've all seen that patient, right? Where they've had edema in their legs for 30 years, right? This is what their soft tissue will look like. You'll actually get calcifications in the soft tissue that look just like this. And the key for me is the type of shadow. If it's, I can't see anything and it's very black, it's much more likely to be uh, um, calcifications due to chronic edema. Um, and if it's a bit of a gray shadow, um, then it's more likely to be um, uh, actually air in the subcutaneous tissue. And part of this too, this one, I'm fairly certain this one was mine and the patient had like no redness to the area at all. It was just regular edema. Um, and so that's another key is that these patients often, it's just regular edema. They might be um, a little bit more swollen than normal, um, but this is very likely to be um, just calcifications from chronic edema versus necrotizing, um, uh, necrotizing soft tissue infections. All right, now, what about this one? Actually, we're gonna skip that one here. And, oh yeah, we'll go to this one. So remember everything I was saying about the shadowing, about the points, 
And this one to me was actually quite tricky. This was a patient that I had, and I actually, I think this was your patient. Mm -hmm. Remember I texted you about it and I asked you about it? Yeah. Yeah, and um, what was the answer? I don't remember. Okay, I'm glad I leave <laughs> such, uh, such an impression on you when I text you. Um, so I'd ask you, because I actually found this on image review, um, and this was a patient that um, was not sick at all and was actually diagnosed with cellulitis in the end. And this reminds me that ultrasound, because this, I, when I looked at this, I was actually scared that it was a missed necrotizing soft tissue they infection. Had, they had a chronic swelling in there. So it's chronic. It was chronic. So what I want to do is I want to remind you guys that the ultrasound is not the only thing that we're doing. We're doing an ultrasound along with a bunch of other stuff. And it's, you know, nothing in medicine is 100% accurate. And as far as bedside tests, the ultrasound is quite sensitive and specific compared to most stuff that we have at the bedside, but you also can't just take that by itself. Now, the one, uh, the picture on the right is a patient that I had a few years ago that I know had necrotizing or a necrotizing soft tissue infection. And notice the gray shadow. It's a little bit more gray, but we're not able to see um, any real architecture deep to it. So right here, right? This is a lot more gray, but I can't actually make any differentiation about what's deep to it. And then let's pause this one. And this, these shadows are much darker, right? So it's a subtle difference between a shadow from a calcification and a shadow uh, from air, but it's something that you need to know that there is a difference for it. Now, that being said, if I have a patient and they are toxic, they're septic, they're hypotensive, they have a fever, and they have this right here, I'm probably going to assume that it's neck fash, honestly. Um, but if I have this with a patient that doesn't look that sick, I'm more, especially with chronic edema, I'm more likely to think that it is chronic edema. What's that? Yeah, it was a really good image. I did give you five out of five on that one because it was really good. Um, uh, all right, normal on the left, and I wanted to show what um, uh, in, uh, what's like uh, adipose tissue, um, uh, a little more extra adipose tissue looks like. That's what we're seeing here. The actual muscle layer, um, it's all the way down here. But this, we're not seeing any real distortion of architecture. I can see all the way down without any issues. This is our classic cobblestoning, and then this over here is a necrotizing infection. Right, let's clear the palate, you guys. What is, what's this? It's an easy one. Yeah? Okay. Right. Let's clean the palate. Because this one's an easy one. Like we know, thank you, pus cystalsis. Um, I would like to take credit for it, but I think it was um, one of my uh, ultrasound colleagues in Stanford that I first heard that from. Her name's Lale Garibaldi. She's a nice lady. All right. Any questions, thoughts, comments on soft tissue? Sweet. We had to, I had to take it one step further. You guys know I'm extra. Yeah. All right, um, we have a patient that comes in. Um, I, I feel like bad, but I feel like this is probably a lot of us, you know, like athletic when we were younger, and then we go through a few years where we're less athletic, and then we start exercising again, and then we feel a pop in our calf. And then we see this. <laughs> I didn't say all of us, I said some, some of us. And uh, I have not ruptured my Achilles, um, but I have uh, destroyed my knee and herniated my back quite a few times. Um, all right. Any questions on this? Anybody not know what we're seeing? I have the probe right here, probe marker facing up. This is the calcaneus right there. This is, um, it's got a name, but it's, it's basically like some kind of joint fat over here. This is the tendon. Now, the reason that I wanted to highlight this as an Achilles tendon tear is because the most classic things that we show are like a very clear, like, here's a chunk of tendon, here's a chunk of tendon, there's blood in the middle. But sometimes they're just going to look like this. Thomas? Yes. Which I think is like the easiest like, way to do it. Um, the, what I do is I basically place a trans... Actually, I'm going to show you a tutorial in a second. Is that okay? It's probably easier. Um, also, you get 40 points for, I think, being the only resident that came to the AMA conference. Yeah, um, great job. What was your favorite lecture, by the way? Well, it's, it's, it's nice. Great, yeah, thank you, thank you. I'll give you your $10 later. <laughs> the, the real answer is the double intubation.
That one was really cool. Yeah, we had uh, Jess Mason and Scott Kobner. Um, Scott Kobner is new Mel Herbert. Uh, actually, I take that back. He's just the new CEO of MRAP. Nobody can be Mel Herbert. Um, but uh, they gave really, really good lectures. And actually, one of the best ones, I thought, was Kobner had a phenomenal lecture on accountability in emergency medicine, which I've literally never even heard that talked about. And it was a really, really good lecture. Like, I got, like, emotional about it because he was very vulnerable. It was a really good lecture. Um, now, I, do you guys see a tear? Going back to this, do you guys see like a full tear? Not really, right? But there is something funky going on right here, right? Now, when I see this, so we can see that the fibers are kind of going down a little bit and then kind of going up a little bit like here. So it's almost like a little like, they're supposed to be like this and they're a bit like this, right? Now, uh, you can get a, a partial tendon rupture. And in fact, not all Achilles tendons need to be surgerized, not all of them. They're small, uh, the patient's not like a collegiate athlete, they don't necessarily need surgery. This is kind of a small one. What I would say is if you see this kind of like a fold, which is kind of what we're seeing here, um, we uh, oftentimes, it's not in this patient, but oftentimes what I'm seeing, there's actually a full tear over here. And because there's no tension, the tendon gets kind of like loosey. It kind of like almost like recoils back a little bit and you might see a little fold more distal from the injury. Although I didn't see it in this patient. Um, I'm gonna pick on you again, Eric. Um, actually, no, Taylor. Why, do you have any idea, um, Taylor F, uh, any idea why we're having this dropout of shadow right here? Like it's a little bit of a dropout of signal, right? Now, why would we get that at a section? There's, there's the, I think that's the actual tear up top, actually. But why would we get a little bit of a, a dropout of signal deep to a tendon that is no longer fully like linear and straight? I guess would be at the parts where you're having mm -hmm. tear, yeah. probably some edema, some bleeding, and so you're having this interface between the tendon, which is harder structure, mm -hmm. versus the fluid below, which is softer. Brilliant. It's almost like you're listening to me. I'm so proud. Um, yes. And also, so there's like multiple reasons why this would happen. And also, has anybody heard of the term anisotropy? You don't have to know what it is, but it's like a thing, right? So what happens is, and you'll see, you, we're actually seeing this at where the tendon attaches to the Achilles. Oops, this was a cross section, I'll show that later. So right around here, eh, we're not seeing it great there, but right where the, I'll show you in a, in a different uh, image, right where the tendon goes into the calcaneus. So imagine this is the calcaneus, tendon kind of goes into it like this. There is going to be black always at the end of that tendon as it goes into the calcaneus. Because if the ultrasound beams aren't hitting the uh, strands of the tendon perpendicular, it's gonna, um, all the signal, so if you hit it perpendicular, all the signal kind of comes back but if it's curved, some of that signal is actually gonna bounce this way and you won't get the signal back. And remember, to, for something to actually show up, be white on ultrasound, it has to actually reflect a signal back, right? So what we're seeing here is we're seeing a fold and because the fibers are turned, the ultrasound signal is getting bounced off that way and not going back up. And that's probably the main reason why you're getting a slight dropout of signal deep to that fold in the tendon is because the beams are going that way, not directly back up to the transducer. It's anisotropy mostly. And then right here, we're seeing the, uh, that same tendon in cross section. I'll be honest, I don't usually, on an Achilles tendon rupture, I usually don't get transverse. But if you want to, you wanna look at it, go ahead and get it transverse. For me, the linear is kind of where it's at. A little primer on how to scan the Achilles tendon. I actually usually have, either I'm lifting the, um, the foot kind of like off, and this is, um, this is pretty gross, isn't it? I don't have like a glove on and I'm touching somebody's foot. I don't know, what, it was a long time ago. Um, or you can just have the patient lay their foot off of the end of the bed, which I found is a little bit more tolerable for the patient. So that's usually what I do because it's really hard, um, right? Let's see, where's my screen? There we go. It's hard for me to find my mouse pointer firstly. It's work. You guys, where's my mouse? Mouse, get over there. Old school. Here, for there to be a good ultrasound signal, this needs to be perfectly flat to the skin, right? Because if there's any air between the two, you won't see it. And if you imagine if you put the transducer right here, you're gonna have this like dropout right in the middle. And if you have the patient uh, dorsiflexed, then the Achilles tendon is gonna be much more straight and a lot easier to actually see. 
So this is um, how I'm actually doing the exam. So in this example, I'm actually tilted the, the foot up a little bit so that I could get that area. And then this right here, this is what I was talking about with anisotropy. You see how it's completely black? And this, is a, this was a med student that I had in Kentucky a long time ago, um, asymptomatic. And you might look at this and be like, well, they have fluid, they have something going on in that area. Maybe it's like an avulsion or something like that. But this is what anisotropy is because the tendons are going directly into the bone right there. So you're not able to see them because the reflection is not coming back up. And what I'm doing is I'm basically tracking all the way up until I get to um, basically the rest of the muscles. And here I'll, this is the Achilles tendon. We feel good with that. These are other muscles that are like deep to it. There's a bunch, there's like, I think it's the flexor hallucis longus is the first one. And then there's like one more. And then they turn into, does uh, anybody know what the two muscles the Achilles tendon turns into are? Soleus and gastroc. All right, strong work. Now, this is a more traditional tear. Now, besides this kind of clear disruption here, and we actually can see this is fluid right here, right in there, there's a bit of fluid. What else? And this is the same patient, by the way. This is one side, and this is the other side. Besides the actual tear, what else do we see about the tendon comparing the two? It's actually why I have the ultrasound images offset. Look at the width. That's the width. And then this is the width of the good one. It's much thicker, right? And that is, to me, um, it's a, a bit of a kind of sensitive sign. So if somebody has pain there, you don't see a tear and the widths are pretty similar, the likelihood of a tendon injury is pretty low. And if you have a patient who has some pain there, you don't see a tear, but the tendon is a bit thicker than the contralateral side, um, it could be a small tear and it could be um, tendonitis also. That's one of the findings of tendonitis, actually, is a thickening of the tendon and then fluid around the tendon without an over a tear. Um, I think we'd, we'll do one more. It's like a fi five more minutes for the next one. You guys, you all good with that? Sweet. All right. Um, we, uh, we have a, uh, my this actually happened to my cousin. A um, uh, patient that comes in, um, is playing with the cat. Cats have murder claws, right? It's cute. They have little beans and then murder claws, right? Um, and had a little scratch. And now it's really, it's hurting and it's very swollen. X-ray doesn't show anything. You know, we always start with the X-ray, no foreign body, right? Which is why we do the X-ray. But you do the ultrasound and you see this. And this is on the flexor side. Yeah. It's what? It's, a, it's here. It's, one of, it's the index finger, we'll say. Yeah, this is the, uh, the proximal phalanx right here. Um, and this is the, uh, the proximal interphalangeal joint. So this is tendon. Yeah, and you see how there's fluid just tracking along the tendon, even a little fluid deep to the tendon. It means that fluid is circumferential on the tendon because we're seeing a tendon with a bunch of fluid around it, but only the right through the middle. So it looks like there's a little above and a little below, but it's really circumferential. This is flexor tenosynovitis. We're actually quite accurate at identifying flexor tenosynovitis um, on ultrasound. Um, but past that, I, I, it's a CT scan, really, or an MRI. But we can do the, if we can do this on ultrasound without having to waste the time, the resources, um, the radiation, um, we should do it. You guys good with the difference between the two? Dr. Siebold? So, yes, brilliant. So one of the things that's a little difficult is the linear transducers, um, they... Um, their focal point, the most shallow focal point, is usually about half a centimeter deep, right? So if you have anything, let's say you have the transducer here, and then you have the, uh, the, the finger, which is quite thin, right? You have it directly on the transducer just with a little layer of gel. Sometimes you don't see very clearly. And so what you need is a step-off pad. You need like a, just about a half an inch of something. Um, or half a centimeter, excuse me, of something. Um, and you can definitely put a giant glob of gel in there, but it's like annoying, it doesn't always stay in the right spot, it slides off to the side, or you can do a water bath, which I'll show you tutorial here in just a little bit. And just to compare, because I like to compare, this is cellulitis. So on this one right here, you see how there's the tendon right there? And you see how the uh, swelling, the extra fluid is only above the tendon? We don't see it deep to the tendon. There's really no fluid on the other side of the tendon. We're just seeing it up here this is cellulitis of the finger rather than a flexor tenus synovitis. Because what we really want to see is do we see fluid deep to it and do we see just a thin layer of fluid tracking? This, I didn't do a full scan, but this was just in this one area, right? 
So this is, um, say, Elias, honestly, with this, there's a chance, like, this could be an abscess. I would have pushed on it to see if it's squishy or not. If it's squishy, probably would be a good idea to just poke it a little bit because it, there is not a whole lot of internal echoes. And then remember that abscesses often have surrounding cellulitis as well. Now, um, great point, Dr. Siebold, on the um, water bath. This is a finger in a water bath. And I just want to show you the difference. I'm doing nothing with the gain, nothing with the focus. All I'm doing is in the water bath and bringing a finger closer to the transducer and further away from the transducer. And look how the image changes. You see how it's much easier to define and it's brighter the further you get away from the transducer? And this is not me saying that you need to be like four inches away from the transducer. It needs to be about, really it's about five millimeters to a centimeter away from the transducer. It's really all that you need. And as long as the casing's intact, which that's any uh, ultrasound machine that's used in a, in a hospital with more than like four people or whatever, you always gotta look at the, the casing of the transducer, make sure it's not cracked. As long as the casing's not cracked, all ultrasound transducers, I don't know of one that isn't, are waterproof. You don't have to put anything extra on them, but they're all waterproof. Just make sure that you don't get any um, liquid in the interface between the probe and the um, cable, because those aren't necessarily waterproof. But you just place the hand in there and then put the transducer just over top of it. You obviously don't need any gel because the whole point of gel is to make sure that there's not any air in between the probe and the finger. And you see here how, and this is, you know, like we all know that, you know, the butterfly doesn't have like the best images, right? Um, but you can see how even with like the butterfly, um, we can get really good images of a very superficial structure. Um, so uh, if you're not sure, use the water bath. All right. And yeah, I think we'll end there. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Okay, great. Thank you so much. I hope that episode of the Ultrasound Leadership Academy Image Review was helpful. I think it goes without saying, but I'm very passionate about musculoskeletal ultrasound, and I think it's helpful for our patients as well. So I definitely recommend learning it. Don't forget to check out ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com. I hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.